TF Green Airport, the dead of the night. No planes move, only a few people are about. But preparations are underway already for the next morning's activities. It's our first inspection of the day. And uh, right now we're gonna go heading down runway 16. This is the first safety um, safety net for the air for the air carriers. Uh, I make sure the airfield itself is safe. I'm looking at all everything. I'm looking at the lights, the condition of the lights, whether they're on, off, uh, damaged in any way. I'm also looking at the pavement. The pavement is in a satisfactory condition. Runway should be a sterile environment. Anything that could get kicked up into an aircraft engine that could cause damage. As we know from past experiences with the Concorde and other aircraft, a uh, small piece of FOD can be disastrous to an aircraft. FOD is uh, an acronym FOD, stands for Foreign Object Debris or Foreign Object Damage. It's anything on the runway that's not supposed to be there. Providence Traffic Airport Vehicle Clear, Runway 1634, Providence. 630 for maintenance. Uh, the last inspection finished approximately 9.30 last night, which was really only four or five hours ago, roughly. It's a little nicer on this shift knowing that it's not as hectic. You can really slow down and do your job much more carefully. Uh, we're not hindered by traffic, air traffic, uh, ground traffic, radio traffic. It's kind of nice to be able to to slow everything down and really look at things. Uh, everything seems standard so far on the inspection. Uh, occasionally we do have outages, you know, light here or a sign there. Providence traffic airport vehicle crossing runway 1634 on runway 5 right, Providence. TF Green Airport closes from midnight until 6 a.m. when the first flights depart. As dawn breaks across the airfield, the slow tempo of night gives way to a new bustle. Over five million people a year, thousands of flights, millions of pieces of luggage, hundreds of destinations. Aircraft depart, climbing into the steadily brightening skies, heading across America. It's busy all at once. Right at six o'clock. Zero six hundred. Everything, everything. All operations are in effect. Yeah, if, if planes want to push back all at once. Well, just about most of the, most of them are all ready to go. And maintenance is out there working right away. Towers out there talking and coordinating everything. It's, it's not like something that gradually starts to build. It's automatically right there. Oh, six hundred. Everything starts going. Sure everything, go back to the gate everything's busy, as you can see. Each night, aircraft are lined up in temporary parking away from the terminal. Space is at a premium, and there are more planes here than gates. As planes depart, other planes are towed from their overnight spots back to the terminal gate, ready for boarding. One airline employee rides in the plane, another drives the tug. If the tow bar inadvertently leaves the nose of the aircraft, brakes away, the person that entered the aircraft goes in the cockpit and he rides the brake. Up to 05, 05, close portion of 5 left with American MD 80, reposition over the gate 12. Up to 05, proceed to gate 12. Proceed to gate 12, ops to 05. American from airport ops, you're clear to the gate. Each night, the extra aircraft are parked on one of the airfield's three runways, which is cordoned off and closed down for the evening. In the morning, after the aircraft are moved off the runway, the barriers are taken away and the runway reopens. Basically between 8 o'clock and 8.10, it's open. I would say 80% of the time it's around 8 o'clock, 8.10. Every morning, trucks get run up, uh, make sure everything's working. We want to make sure everything's right up to snuff. Providence Tower, rescue 306, radio check. 306, Providence Tower, loud and clear. 306, receiving the same. Check the, uh, the camera out for uh, light vision. Just make sure everything works on it. It's on a joystick. 
basically in the real deal, if you know we had a crash and the plane was definitely on fire, we'd be approaching flowing water and foam. As we approach, we'd be foaming it down, and, you know, foam it down a little bit, try and knock down the initial fire on the fuselage itself to try and keep that cool for the passengers. And that's you know the main function is to keep that fuselage cool and you know try and keep a bearable temperature for the passengers. Best bet, hopefully, all the time is to try and get a door if possible, since you're going to be able to get the most people out of a door. It's very difficult for us to get into the interior of the aircraft just by the nature of their construction. We have to have the ability to extinguish that rapidly so that the passengers can then exit the aircraft safely in an environment that is free of uh, flame and smoke, etc. The other problem that we run into is we only have six men on duty at one time. And we're running three trucks and two guys in each truck and one truck has an officer in it. So basically we have four guys, well, you know, five guys actually. That's hoping everybody's in. You know, if somebody's out on vacation, you know, we don't, we have a four-man minimum. So if there's five of us here, that's what we have. When we go back to the small contingent of people we have here, we have to avail ourselves of the latest technological advances, the uh, latest pieces of equipment that are, uh, that are available. Don't know what to expect. We get an alert and, you know, for, say, smoke in the cockpit or something, and you don't know what's going to happen. You know, nine times out of ten, luckily, it's a faulty light or a circuit breaker that's gone bad, but one never knows. United 587 Providence Tower, runway 23 left, taxi in a position to hold. I'm just clearing the pilots to land and making sure the runway is in fact clear. On the arrivals, the radar controllers would switch the aircraft over to this position, me, uh, about five, six miles out, and then I would give them a clearance to land. I'm here, 857, correction, 957, turn right taxiway, Delta, ground point now. Delta point now, coming 957. Once the pilot has taken off and made it about a mile or two off the airport, uh, I switch them to the radar controllers downstairs uh, who take over monitoring of the flight. We have a departure getting ready to go. Once I have enough room to get the airplane out on the runway for takeoff, um, I advise the pilot he can go into position and hold. Northwest 207 Providence Star, runway 23 left, taxi in a position, hold traffic, Embraer, four and a half mile front. I clear the pilot for takeoff. Once he's airborne, I switch him to departure control. Northwest 207, contact departure, have a good flight. Return to 280, clear to go, 23 left, Northwest 207. It's 9.30 is when the first big arrival period comes, where we have about 15 or 18 arrivals over a half hour period. And then we'll have, it starts getting arrivals and departures then between 9.30 and 10, a mix of both. And we're gonna have about five or six arrivals now in the next 10 minutes or so. Continental 363, turn right to Winnable, ground point nine. Southwest 1197, Providence Tower, runway 23 left, taxi in a position and hold. Southwest 1197, turn left, heading 160, join the Providence 180 radio, clear for takeoff. 60 heading, join up on the 180, clear for takeoff, Southwest 1197. The passengers I don't really think about, especially when I'm busy, I'm not thinking about them very much at all. I realize there are passengers in all the planes, but it doesn't make any difference whether there are 150 people or two people on board. Um, I'm trying to get the planes in and out as quickly as I can. And most controllers really enjoy being challenged a little bit and, uh, and uh, y you feel good when you've worked a busy period for a half hour or so. It, it's very safe and orderly. It seems chaotic at times, uh, but we, we, take, we go to great lengths to make sure that we keep everybody separated and the airplanes don't get near each other. That's our main focus, that's our primary job, is to prevent any potential mid-air collisions from happening and to get airplanes there as quickly as possible. I have done uh, three round trips to Nantucket and one round trip to Martha's Vineyard. Uh, the flights have been pretty full. We obviously tried to uh, fly with uh, nine people, a full airplane, back and forth. We've had probably about uh, close to 10, 15 flights already. We'll probably have about about another 10 more before we leave here, and we leave about 8.15. Having the airplanes that we have, the Cessna 402s, we're very uh, open in uh, our communications with the people that we carry. Um, they can see us and know exactly what we're doing. Alrighty, folks. You all have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.
and it automatically uh, enhances the uh, uh, communication and the kind of camaraderie we have uh, with nine people uh, in Cessna 402. It's, it's very uh, enjoyable. No, we same as people. Everyone's an individual. And after a while you start to know people on a first name basis. To us they're not seats, they're not you know, a means to you know, just create you know, income. They say how we do and you know, and it's, it's kind of like a, we have a rapport with most of our passengers, I like to think. You know, we don't have first class seating or offer drinks, you know, but we, what we do do is you know, we get them there in a timely fashion. Uh, one of our biggest sell points also is consistency. So we're always flying, we're always up there, we'll, we'll bring an aircraft in for somebody if they miss a flight. Uh, you know, we'll try to accommodate passengers in any way, shape we can. It's, you know, that's what we do. That's how we run. People ask me sometimes, why don't you get bored? I said, no. I said, look at it this way. Uh, my office uh, is, the view in my office is always different than uh, the ones who are sitting in the office uh, in a building. And that helps in uh, reducing the monotony of doing the same thing over and over again. Our people are always different. The view is always different. The other difference is that the type airplane is the same, but we even fly different airplanes, although it's the same model. See a vehicle parked over there in an area where they're not supposed to be. That's a commercial vehicle area. This is a taxi stand, okay? You have to find the short-term lot or circle on the inside, okay? These spots are paid for. Go ahead. Who wants to get in the short-term parking lot and wait in lines like this to get out? You know, it's a necessary evil. But you know, with that comes people not wanting to pay the three or four dollars, whatever it costs to park. You know, and which is fairly reasonable. You can't beat the signage. It's right there. You know, everything's open. Nothing's full. There's, there's no reason why people can't. People can't park. They just choose not to. Let me tell you, when you work under that roadway and you see the same car driving around for three hours, you pretty much pull them over and give them the money to park because you're tired of seeing them. Outside the terminal, traffic piles up as people come off flights. A problem develops in a short-term parking lot where a computer glitch has backed up traffic at the toll booths. Because it's all computerized and they stick the, the tickets in a machine, they had some kind of slowdown in their operational system which, you know, caused a small backup, which as planes come in and people get back to their cars is now causing a large backup. Well, I think just having a presence kind of cools heads, you know? People that were, may have been tempted to be confrontational with people here out at the booths. I mean, it's not, you know, it's really not their fault. I mean, they're doing the best they can to get people in and out of here. So those people that would, be tempted to be confrontational up there, or maybe you'd be thinking twice when they pull up. And of course, you know, they have a right to be frustrated when they're sitting in traffic waiting to get, you know, waiting to go home. Everybody has their in things that they enjoy. You know, I don't, I don't mind being out here dealing with the public. It's the part I enjoy the most. A work crew is installing and leveling a new security system on the sidewalk outside the terminal. The new high-powered x-ray machines used before passengers check in will examine all baggage headed for the aircraft hold. It's a new line of defense in finding any terrorist bombs intended to blow up a plane and is a major development after the September 11th attacks. The changes you'll see at the airport um, at any airport across the country is how do you deal with the issue of checked baggage. The previous protocol for checked baggage security really uh, was an offshoot of the Pan Am crash over Lockerbie where um, a, a terrorist had placed an explosive bag uh, in the hold or, or with, with someone uh, and the person who was carrying it didn't know it was an explosive. Uh, so they, they established new protocols from that point that said, you know, you make sure people don't take bags that aren't theirs, and oddly enough, people do that. Uh, it sounds odd, but they do. Uh, and uh, and they, they do positive bag match, which means that if, you're, if you check bags and you're not on the plane, that bag comes off. 
Well, those days are gone as well because obviously the people that, uh, that launched the attack on September 11th last year did so knowing they were going to kill themselves. So now there has to be a new way to screen all bags that everybody brings on board. And that's why you have these large uh, explosive detection systems that are now cropping up across the nation and, and airports. We got ahead of the curve here uh, and were able to get about 11 of those explosive detection systems placed in the front of the house at least to get us going by the December 11th uh, deadline so that all check bags could be screened. What I think ultimately the airports want to get to is to have all that stuff behind uh, in the back of the house, behind the wall, so that the passengers coming in who are checking their bags can check their bags, they'll go in and they'll, all that screening will take place without having to fill up a lot of space inside the terminal, without having to hold up passenger necessarily. Our ultimate goal is to, and then the next build out that we do in our facility, to put all that stuff behind the wall and will become transparent to the passenger. A charter flight from the Portuguese Azores Islands taxis in. U.S. Customs and immigration officers come specially to TF Green to meet the international flight, which flies in only once a week. Number one, we're looking to, to put it quite simple that uh, bad people and bad things don't enter the U.S. There's the narcotic problem, and of course now we're in a, unfortunately, in a new era where we have to worry about uh, other hazards, possible uh, you know, we weapons of mass destruction um, and possible terrorists entering the country. As part of his duties, the customs officer checks the badges of airline workers handling the park jet. And we basically just go and we do what we we do a quick sweep, make sure the people around the aircraft, uh, people who should be there, who have been through our background, and who have the proper seal on their ID. Inside the terminal, passengers from the flight move through immigration and customs. The agencies carry out a silent but well-scripted screening. Primarily a lot of our work is done in advance. We have the IBIS system, which is shared between customs and immigration, other federal agencies. And we basically um, take a look at you know, who's coming in on the flights in advance and uh, we try to put a response commensurate with, uh, with what we think uh, may be coming at us. We couple that intelligence with uh, observational techniques. Uh, basically, we observe the people, how they behave. Tonight it was very hot in this hall. I mean, it would be very unusual if someone had a sport coat not to remove that jacket. The reality is you are, you're trying to uh, cull out uh, the few from the many, and uh, obviously the only way to really do that is to talk to people. Basically, we, uh, we try to read people, and we ask them uh, what we think of appropriate questions and look for inconsistencies. Thank you. And we put all that together, and basically it's uh, make a determination of who we uh, maybe want to stop or what we maybe want to stop from coming into the country. Midway through the evening shift, a startling call has come to the airport police dispatcher. Officers spread the word quickly throughout the department. Greg Levitch! This is Mepic. What's happening? I just, not much. I just want to let you know that uh, we received a phone call from 911. Uh, apparently they had a phone call that came in from the Buttonwoods neighborhood at a payphone. Uh, sounded like a kid's voice saying that there was a bomb at the airport. There was a bomb threat that was received via 911 operator uh, from a, a public telephone in the city of Warwick. Uh, someone whispered that there was a bomb at the airport and hung up. Uh, the call came in from uh, John John Scott from Buttonwoods Liquor and Warwick is responding. They're going to let us know what they find out when they get there. Warwick's responding, not here. Warwick's responding to the payphone, yeah, not here. Warwick, responding is, well, Warwick is responding to the uh, liquor store where the call came in from. Just so, just so you know, okay? It was a non-specific threat. We just went down our checklist. John Scott. Mr. Scott. Cell phone. Too. Because a non-specific threat, it wasn't uh, geared towards any airline or a specific place or person at the airport. Uh, what we do is we just do a, a complete perimeter check of all the airport property, uh, anything suspicious, packages, vehicles, anything parked near the fence. Uh, we do a complete interior search of the terminal. Just to let you know, absolutely. And uh, this isn't to go That's over the it. radios at all. We've okay, received I'm a just giving you the courtesy. Uh, bomb all right, threat. buddy. 
most of the time it's not within public knowledge that this is going on. It's not within the airline's knowledge that this is going on. And uh, unless it's a, a specific threat, uh, we kind of go about it I'm just letting you know through our own channels. Midway through the evening, the activity at the Southwest Airlines area of the terminal is steadily increasing. Even as some Southwest flights depart, more and more planes arrive from across the country. At TF Green, Southwest has fewer gates than planes. And so, for some planes, as soon as the passengers disembark, the aircraft must be quickly inspected and be ready to be towed to overnight parking away from the terminal onto runway 5 left. That frees the gate to receive more incoming flights. Uh, right now, we repositioned the plane out of, out of the gate because uh, we needed to open the gate for the next aircraft coming in. And you don't have a bank of flights that start arriving until about after 9, uh, 9 to 11. But then it gets busy again after 9, and then especially at 11 o'clock for all the, the meter greeters that are coming in and waiting for the flights that arrive at that time period. Before a plane is moved, it must be reprovisioned. Then a Southwest ramp supervisor checks the plane inside and out. Then it is ready for towing. He'll be at the controls riding the brakes as it is towed away. I need to check uh, all the pins on, make sure you know all, all the pins closed, everything's done before moving the plane. And after that, we started you know all the procedure for move the plane, and we're ready to go. I take the control of the plane. You know when the, my guy pushed the plane out to the. Uh, out of the gate, out of the gateway. We do every night the same, the same. Uh, in the morning, you know, they bring the plane, and the night shift, they pull the plane. Our normal operation is five, five in the morning to midnight. You know, you go with the flow. Uh, it's unusual for some, uh, but we're unusual folks that work uh, in the airport and in the airline industry. Well, is, is your day almost over now, or still? Oh, no, 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 no. My, uh, I don't get an end, really, you know, when the last plane coming in. Well, you know, it's no matter with me. I can work in the morning, I can work at night, you know. It's no problem with me. It's fun for me every time, all the time, you know. Anywhere, you know, in the, in the, in the ramp, in the floor, in the ground, or in the carpet. It's no problem with me. As the last flights arrive and the airport begins to wind down its operations for the night, airport police are still at work on the bomb threat received earlier. 3-6, be advised, you're breaking up the beginning of that. I didn't catch most of the beginning. But nothing has been found and the threat appears to be a hoax with only one loose end remaining. We're wrapping up the conclusion now. Uh, we're checking on a vehicle that's parked on the eastern fence line of the airport. It's just something that is routine that we'll check. Uh, we notified the city of Warwick. Uh, they're going to send somebody out. We also have one of our officers uh, out there with the vehicle. And just, you know, better to be safe than sorry. I think for the most part, as in any police work, you have the nights where, you know, you're, you're banging into each other. You know what I mean? Uh, there's you know, not much going on. You're just out there making your presence felt. And there's other nights where, you know, full moon or not, you know, there's a million things that happen, as in like any other city or town. Receive, you just want to make sure that, uh, you know, all your guys are safe and that, uh, you know, everything's being done that has to be done. Ops, cross runway 2 cross and 2 through left on Bravo. At airport operations, we have actually we maintain the airport and do the inspections and make sure everything is safe uh, for the air carriers and, and the airlines that use the airport. For the most part, the, at this point in time, as time of night, uh, the airport's kind of winding down. We do have a, a lot more arrivals, very few departures. We do have a voluntary curfew here uh, at, at TF Green Airport. Uh, there are no scheduled air carrier operations uh, between midnight and 6 a.m. Hopefully this uh, keeps the noise complaints down because there are a lot of residential areas that surround the airport. Providence Ground Ops 204 is clear the movement air. I'm 204, roger. Unfortunately, most of us are in this in the field and line of work we're in because we love dealing with aircraft. We've always 
enjoyed watching them land, take off. Maybe it's the power, maybe it's the grace and beauty that something that heavy can get airborne, fly. But it's just always exciting and exhilarating to see them land and take off as uh, the one is doing behind us. At the airport operations, we have actually, we go 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. Um, we're here. Uh, we don't close down for holidays, nights, weekends, or anything like that. Uh, my shift ends at midnight. Uh, we do have an, some, another personnel that stays here from 10 at night until 6 in the morning. And then they're uh, eventually replaced by an incoming crew in the morning. The last flight landed at TF Green at 5 minutes past midnight. All flights arrived safely without delays. There were no major incidents affecting the safety of the airport, and the airport settled into a quiet night, awaiting the arrival of dawn the next day, when staff would start again the next day's activities.